Hey everyone, welcome to week 36. This is day three, this is Wednesday, our ongoing instead of white week. So we're trying to replace our white in our palette with another pigment. Monday, we did uh, Let Tin Yellow yesterday for Spanish Tuesdays, Martes Español. We replaced it with our Bismuth Yellow. Today, we're gonna replace it with a super weird color. I've never used it before. A painter friend of mine suggested it. Let's see how we do. Okay, let's get started. This is day three of our instead of white uh, week. And remember, what we're trying to do is quote unquote replace white with another pigment in our palette. And the idea behind it is not really to question if we can do a painting without white because the quick answer would be obviously we can. If we take out any color from our palette, we would be able to make a painting. So there are no essential colors in our palette. They become more and more essential if we impose a specific use onto them. So the idea behind this is not just to say, oh, I'm gonna miss white, you know, how can I replace it? Uh, how can I make other colors act as if they were white? I think that a parallel reflection uh, during this week is also to say, yeah, we're not really gonna replace the white, but let me see if my brain can actually start understanding how it uses white. And in my case, how I overuse white. I talked about it on Monday, how I think that in my painting, white is a very important color, not because it's a color I use to lighten things. I think it ends up being a color I constantly go to for example, to shorten my value scale, that's very, very important to minimize contrast. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, there's no contrast in my painting, but I am just naturally attracted to grayness. So I tend to go to white plus other colors for sure to try and achieve that grayness to lower saturation and again to have a much tighter uh, value range within my paintings. So I know that I go to it constantly, constantly. And working on the paintings during this week has made me notice how my brain just instinctually, how my eyes just go to my left side of the palette constantly, like upper left, because that's, you know, where I keep my white. My brain just goes there all the time, just looking for that white pigment because I would instinctually just go there and gravitate towards the white and just grab a little bit of it and mix it with poof, almost all of my lights and all of my midtones. So it's really awesome to see how that ritual, that repetition that I have within my painting practice is something that is being heightened by the fact that white is not there anymore. The lack of white is teaching me about how I use white, which is actually awesome. I mean, the fact that I've denied myself the possibility of using it is actually teaching me more than if I was just paying attention of how I normally use it. Um, I think that that's a very, very important, almost academic tool in the sense that the absence of those variables can actually teach us about those very variables. So that's a road worth taking if you want to evaluate how you're using your palette or if you think you're overusing a certain hue or a certain specific pigment, just take it away and see if that hinders your painting, maybe see how you adjust. And in the process, you may evaluate and you may gauge how much you really, really need it and how you have to go back to it. Or perhaps you realize, wow, I can actually paint. You know, I can actually make paintings that look like solid paintings where there is no need, where I'd, I'm not yearning for that other color that I thought was absolutely essential to my painting. So it's almost like redefining the indispensable quality that we've, again, imposed onto those tools. Maybe they're not as important as we thought they were initially. So on Monday, what we did was, again, replace. I'm always going to use that word, but it's always going to have quotes. We're not really replacing. We're trying to find a temporary color that can act as a reminder of that color that was once there. You know, it's going to be a new color, it's going to have new properties, but it's also going to remind us that it is taking the place of white in our palette. So we're putting it there just to 
almost solidify the absence of white. That's the role of that color. So we are gaining a lot of things, a lot of the properties, a lot of the qualities that that new color has to offer, but we're also being reminded constantly that white is not there. Those two are the lessons that we are getting as soon as we introduce a new color. Now on Monday, as I was saying, we introduced a color that wasn't really that far from white if you think about it. Um, in terms of value, it is very close. In terms of handling, I mean, it's close if you think about it being close to its cousin, lead white. It does handle a little bit differently from the more buttery uh, titanium white. But uh, in terms of value, again, and in terms of brightness, it's quite close. The really big difference is the fact that lead tin yellow is actually a yellow. It's of a yellow hue. And that yellowness is very, very apparent once you start mixing it with other colors. So every single mix that we had in that painting, particularly those that were in the you know, mid-tone to light range had a very visible trace of that lead tin yellow. You could understand that there is a presence there of that color. Because I was thinking of the presence of that color, I thought, okay, let's make that even more evident with Tuesday's painting where I said, now that we are working with yellows and we've had that odyssey with yellows with last week with that transparent uh, yellow oxide lake, you know, let's keep working in the yellow hue. This is going to be interesting. And I thought I would just eliminate in a way um, my white from my regular palette. So what I had was the palette that I've been using for, I don't know, couple of years now maybe, which is uh, titanium white, bismuth yellow, cad red, alizarin, cobalt ultramarine or ultramarine, and raw umber. That's my go-to regular palette. I feel that with that palette, I can paint just about anything, to be honest. Um, so all I did was not really replace the white because all I did was just eliminate it from the palette. I said, okay, you're gone. And now I'm going to have just bismuth yellow as my lightest color in that palette. My lightest value is going to be the one that's inherent to uh, bismuth yellow as a pigment. So if I want to make something lighter, I have to go to that bismuth yellow or I have to respect the other color's native value. And I was saying yesterday how I had an original intent to have a ton of hues within that painting because I had noticed that lead tin yellow had an effect over my mixes in the first painting. So I thought, well, I don't want to do that. I want to have like other hues be quite visible and quite different in this painting. And as soon as I put that ground, you know, that quote unquote ground, that imprimatura, of yellow, a very transparent yellow. I thinned it down with liquid with an alkyd medium and I just, you know, put it down on that piece of paper. I was like, oh my God, this is a super bright, beautiful color. It, it has gorgeous saturation. I have to use this. And it, the color was almost begging me to just say, hey, let me be overpowering. Let me be in every single mix. Let me be in every single hue that you're gonna put in your palette. And that's kind of what I did. I really listened to my paintings. I think they talk to me. I mean, that sounds maybe crazy, but I had a direction for this painting and that direction had to be sort of corrected so I could paint something that was congruous with the execution of the painting. I thought I knew what I wanted to do, but uh, this is offering me some you know, new alternatives. I'm gonna do that and see how it goes. I let the brightness of that initial transparent imprimatura be my lightest, brightest value in that painting. And then I did model with straight uh, bismuth yellow. Bismuth yellow has some body to it, so it, it is actually quite possible to model with it, to push it around and, and model it as if it was a very sculptural color. I think there's a slight difference between the modeled, more opaque paint layer when compared to the more transparent, brighter layer where just the brightness of the paper is just coming through the transparent layer of paint. There is a very slight difference, but in terms of value, they're quite close. Um, I would say the difference being just the brightness of it and the saturation, which is obviously higher in the uh, more transparent moments. So that was yesterday's painting of Bernadette. By the way, I just want to say that she's an incredible, incredible painter, incredibly talented. And I think that that led me to this painting where I was thinking, okay, I wanna have the ability to access the brightness that is available to me 
when I use a semi-transparent color, bismuth yellow is not quite super transparent or semi-transparent. There is some opacity to it, but still when thinned down a little bit with uh, liquid, it really does behave like a, like a lake-ish yellow. So it was very, very nice. And I was like, yes, I want to do this. And I was reminded of, you know, all the fighting that we did last week with that yellow. And I was like, you know what? I have a weirder color here that my friend Keita Morimoto uh, suggested to me when I was in uh, Toronto a bunch of years back. And he suggested this strange color. I wasn't really familiar with this brand, Kama. I guess it's a Canadian brand, maybe. And this color is called Azo, Azo, Green Gold, Azo, Green Gold. I don't even know how to say it. I mean, that's how ignorant I am about this color. So what it is, is a transparent yellow green or green yellow or earthy green yellow. I can't define it. Honestly, I really can't. Uh, straight off the tube, you really feel that it's a green and it looks like a rich kind of mid-tone green. But as soon as I said, okay, I want to access that transparent quality, you know, that Imprimatura that I tried with Bernadette, I'm going to try with this green gold. I was surprised because what I got was more of a yellow than a green, at least in my eyes. I was like, okay, this is going to be that yellow lake nightmare all over again. This is just such a strange color. But it, instead of having the ability that I had with that yellow lake to say, I'm going to use you as an opaque color, you know, I'm going to mix that lake with my white and I'm going to be able to access like another quality that is inherent to that pigment. I told myself there is no white so I have no way to access the manner in which it was going to present itself if I were to mix it with other lighter colors. And the other thing I did was as soon as I put that color in, I realized uh, maybe my cad red is actually lighter than this color. It's quite different. I mean cad red being far more opaque, very very saturated and as soon as I saw that the idea idea of having a color replace the white also involved having that value replace the lightest value in my palette and how that could be sort of contested by having a cad red in there which would have been the lightest color in my palette I said ah I can't use cad red you know it's there but I'm not going to touch it you, you guys can tell that I'm not touching that cad red so what I did was I just realized okay I can only use the green gold I can use my alizarin I can use my raw umber and I can use my cobalt ultramarine. That's about it. That's all I can use. But here's the thing. Because I noticed that it was a very transparent color, it's a beautiful, beautiful, rich, saturated, transparent color, this green gold. I was like, I can't do anything but a transparent painting. There's no way for me to just add opacity to this painting. If you think about it, I had that green gold that is transparent or semi-transparent. I had a lizard and crimson, which is basically a lake, so it's absolutely transparent. I had cobalt ultramarine, which, you know, the cobalt part of it is a little more opaque than the ultramarine part of it. And I had raw umber, which is, you know, maybe a little bit more opaque, but it's the darkest value in my palette. So that's not going to help me in trying to mix the uh, lighter values of the painting. So very quickly, I realized, okay, the only way I can access lightness or the idea of lightness in this painting is if I respect my paper, is if I acknowledge that my substrate can actually provide me with lightness. And I wanted to evidence that. As soon as I realized that, I was like, okay, if I can't replace the lightness in my palette with that gold green, I'm going to have to make up for it by leaving untouched an area of the raw paper. And maybe that sounds like cheating, but it's not. You know, that's our substrate. So we're not really painting with anything. We're just leaving our substrate be. And that's totally fine in my opinion. Nothing in the rules said that I couldn't use my paper. So <laughs> I am um, I'm very happy that I told myself, dude, Come on, if you have brightness there, if you have lightness that is coming from your paper, use it. And that's why at the beginning, kind of like what happened with Bernadette's painting yesterday, I had an intention. I thought that green gold, azo, azo, green gold 
was going to behave in a very particular way, and it wasn't. It wasn't at all what I was expecting. I'm actually pretty curious to see how it behaves with white and how, you know, that kind of green-yellow mixes with reds. I think that it probably makes beautiful, beautiful kind of neutral colors. But anyways, as soon as I realized that I had to respect its um, transparent nature, I was like, yeah, there's no way I can paint this in the traditional way I paint stuff. I have to do a transparent painting. I have to treat it as if it was a watercolor, but I want to acknowledge that these are oils, that they handle differently, that they travel that surface when you drag that brush across the um, substrate in a very different way from a watercolor. So I wanted to speak about that, how it clearly feels different from you know, any other type of paint, even if we are using it transparently. I'd like to believe that I could tell at a painting done with transparencies, if it was a watercolor or if it was a, an acrylic painting or if it was an oil painting, I think I can tell uh, when it is an oil painting. And I'm not speaking about it being uh, glossy or anything that has to do with oil, but just because of how painting feels, you know, underneath the brush. So the model for this painting is the amazing, the incredible, one of the most important artists of the latter half of the 20th century, one of the most sculptors of our time, uh, Louise Bourgeois. She's a French-American painter. Uh, she was born in France, but she married, and she ended up living in New York until she... Uh, until she died. And I think we're all very, very familiar with her sculptures, her giant spiders, which are absolutely beautiful. I mean, the, um, the reason for her gravitating towards uh, her spiders was really beautiful in the way she explained it. And I've always remembered this. She said that a spider is not concerned when you destroy its web, it just webs it back again, it just constructs it back again. But it doesn't suffer if you destroy its web. And I always felt that that was beautiful you know the fact that a lot of painting a lot of working as an artist is that feeling the feeling that we are walking in this tightrope where we are very vulnerable and um, you know critics may destroy our work or public opinion may destroy our work or worst of all the way we are overly critical with ourselves can destroy our work and our self-esteem and how our job is to just keep constructing and can't really stop and dwell upon how other people feel about our work or how other people see it or the myriad of ways that they can criticize it. We have to keep constructing. We have to reflect and we have to keep constructing. And I always thought that that was amazing. I, I find an echo of that teaching of her and what we've been doing in this project because every single day is a new opportunity to paint for us. So. Even though yesterday's painting may have been a triumph, even though yesterday's painting may have been a dud, it doesn't matter. You kind of have to keep going. You have to, you know, very quickly just say, what did I learn from yesterday and how can I grow from it? How can I just keep going? How can I reconstruct this spider web and just keep going? And even though my own failures are also going to be responsible for the fragility of that web, I have to be aware that it is my job to just keep going and going and going and going. And the other thing that she, um, she was very adamant about, it had to do with the fact that there was this constant searching and how she was very concerned with the ability she had to try and explain explain to herself what she was doing and how that couldn't really come from the outside that had to come from within so the fact that you would do something and it was also yes your job to keep constructing but the way you would keep constructing was by trying to explain things to yourself and to try to find reason for those very things through your own explanation through your own experiences and I think that that self-reliance is actually incredibly important and I think she she was just like a monolithic figure in that sense. Um, she was so, so important for all of us artists in that way where she nurtured herself. She actually taught herself. She grew from her own experiences. And it's not to say that we artists are self-sufficient, but at some point in our lives, we have to believe that even though we don't know what we're doing, we know what we're doing. We know if we're heading towards the right direction because we are going to be the only ones that are gonna be able to answer those questions. So I thought she was perfect. She was the perfect person to depict in this painting. And I thought that the uh, transparency in which I solved the painting uh, could also echo her watercolors and, and some of her drawings because she was obviously huge in sculpture, but she was also a remarkable painter and uh, printmaker. So I wanted to echo some of those 
uh, washes that she would do in her watercolors and try to see if that nature could remain kind of alive in the way I portrayed her. So I was very happy with this painting. The modeling of form has nothing to do with the amount of paint we put on top of a surface or how much a technique can define how form should be modeled. No, a painting has to follow its own path. And I think that I was at the mercy of the path that was put in front of me and I was like, okay, we're doing this, you know, this is the painting that we have to do and I just have to be sensitive towards it. So I was very, very happy that I let myself say, hey, I thought I was going to paint something different. I thought I was going to be using this color in a way, way different way. But no, as soon as I put it down, I was like, okay, this is not what I expected. I have to adjust and I have to... Um, not only change the way I paint, but actually try to find the potential that it has and very quickly say, yeah, we're doing this type of painting now and just know that that's going to be the character of this painting and try to push it as far as I can. So I was very happy that I let myself do that. So today, even though we are not using the opacity of white because we are replacing it with the brilliance of our surface, of our substrate, we realized that, yeah, that's not cheating, you know, that's right there for us to do. Should we want to use it, then, you know, it is absolutely available to us as a form of expression. So that was it for today. I'll see you guys tomorrow where I think we're going to model a little bit uh, with our colors now. We're going to do something a little bit different from today. We're going to go back to the opaque quality of colors. And I think it's going to be fun because I'm going to use a color that I don't really ever use, but there's going to be a little bit of cheating inside that pigment, uh, but that's tomorrow. So I'll let you guys know how I'm cheating tomorrow. So I'll see you tomorrow for that. Bye.